Hi, Patrick. Hi, Dr. M. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Today is 6th December. Thanks a lot. And uh, great. It is uh, probably evening in Australia, right? Yeah, uh, early evening. Early evening. Okay. It's, uh, it's around uh, afternoon, it's, yeah. somewhere around 12.30 over here in India. And uh, so nice to see you. Uh, there's a lovely painting behind you. I like the painting yeah. behind you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me uh, share uh... okay so uh... Now, patrick ross i don't have to uh, introduce you everybody knows in the uh, continuous improvement uh, community uh, but then as a host i have to introduce you so let me finish that formality. And it's, I'm really thrilled that you're going to tell us a story. So here we are, and uh, it's going to be an interactive session. So you can take your time and uh, we will go deep into it. I'm not worried about whether it is uh, 45 minutes or 60 minutes, but it goes on record, right? No problem. Yep. So uh, Patrick Ross, you are going to tell us the boss story and how in the boss story you're going to tell us sustaining continuous improvement processes. And you're authority on that because uh, you were there for 25 years, you were in Bosch. Yep. And as a regional president of automotive electronics in Australia. And then you were also a vice president responsible for operation in Australia and director of Robert Bosch uh australia. australia and that's 25 long years that you spent and then various assignments you had in europe uk germany mm -hmm. and the responsibility uh, in china and malaysia yep right yes you didn't stop at that because you have a lovely mix of uh, corporate working corporate working uh, gamba working looking at the entire continuous improvement program and working with bosch you also are into academics, as I see from here. Yep. yep. In the Department of Management, Monsha University. Monash. 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 Yes. Ah, that's and that also in an MBA program. Mm -hmm. Remarkable and so nice that I have you on this program and thanks for accepting my invitation. My pleasure. Okay, and then uh, you went off and be. Uh, to insight manufacturing, which was micro, micro company manufacturing a range of products for security doors, general buildings. Yep. And you are, uh, even currently, you are there in the advisory council for environmental essentials, even now? No, 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 I've, I've left that as well, and now that I'm retired, so. No, you can't retire. You're, going to, you're doing some advisory work uh, right yeah. now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, so there you are, twenty five years, and who better can tell the Bosch story? But then here is the man, mm, the man, the and I love Robert Bosch, and I love what he said. Never forget your humanity and respect human dignity in your dealing with others. This he said way back in 18... 1931. Yeah. Can you imagine? And now uh, these days we are talking about respect for people. In the yep. CA community is a popular word mm. called respect for people. And Robert realizes that that is a way forward for continuous improvement of processes. Mm. Not only that, I love this quote of his too. He says none of us should ever be satisfied with what has been achieved and should always endeavor to do better. Now you can't have a better uh, definition of continuous improvement in every sphere of life. I mean, ev everything is a process, right? There's an input conversion and an output and the feedback loop, the entire life, whether right from the kitchen, as I say to NASA in our life, and of course, 
we can term it as lean Toyota, we can put whatever names that you want, but it's a process. And he realized it at that point of time that there's no end to this. It's good, got to keep improving. And that's what Kaizen is all about. That's what my sensei Masaki might always say, whatever you are today, you should improve tomorrow. So I let you go, and this I like. Bosch invented for life. I mean, I'm sure you will tell us how you got this uh, title, invented for life. So I leave it to you. And there you are. It's story time, uh, Patrick. I hand over to you. Right. So Thank I'm you. getting out of my screen, and let's hear. Let's hear you now, the, the yeah. Bosch story. Yeah. All yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram, for having me. Um, look, the story I will talk about is a real life uh, story. And um, of, of course, I'm going to give you some fantastic insights and conclusions that look really impressive and that are really impressive. But what you must always think about is this is a story that spans nine, 10 years, and at a lot of the parts of this story, none of us really had uh, a specific idea of a big picture. Yeah? So let's start from the, the start. As, as, as Dr. M mentioned with a quote from Robert Bosch, continuous improvement uh, was always something that was part of the Bosch culture from 25, 30 years ago. So therefore, uh, this was part of uh, the activity. And we, Bosch in Australia, were uh, doing uh, continuous improvement. And, uh, and in the early days, it started as quality circles and then moved into the real CIP type task. We were doing this as well, uh, if not better than most of our peers in Australia, for two reasons. First of all, we had a lot of uh, uh, DNA and a lot of the support from the headquarters, which were doing it great in, in Germany and around the world, but also because we had a bunch of very enthusiastic, passionate people. What we were doing was what most of the industry was doing. And the, the basic model was, you know, management would go to people and say, we want you to have ideas for improvement. We would give them a few little bits of training in terms of how to come up with ideas. And then we would say, and now it's over to you. And of course, you get mixed results. You get uh, some areas and some people had fantastic ideas about how to fix management, how to fix the running of the company and how to fix everything else except what was in their area. And, and, you know, it's true, I, it sounds a bit tongue in cheek, but it's true. And then we also had people that really gave some good ideas about what they wanted to do in their own area. Um, and, but then, you know, after about, you know, a one year period, it starts to lapse. So then we came up with the uh, usual process of incentives, monetary incentives, token incentives, uh, management, animating idea sessions, uh, management walking around wanting to people to present their CIP projects, etc. And when we were doing this at that time, and we, this is a period of three, four years, we felt that we were doing it very well. First of all, because we were getting a result ourselves, but also when, when uh, industry peers would look at us at a benchmark. They'd have tools of companies and, and, and societies and organize, and you know, various think tank groups would come to us and see. So we felt that this was, uh, we were onto something, this was very good. But then we also started to, the question was starting to be asked, if the word continuous improvement it has to be continuous. Yep. What we were saying, seeing was a continuation of, of ideas and suggestions mm. that were called CIP. Mm. 
And I'm making this point because, you know, this question uh, would always come out. Uh, after three or four years, a lot of the managers and different people, including myself, would question this. But on the other hand, we said, well, you know, this is what it is because we looked around uh, the world. And at that time, initially, the access into the depths of Toyota was not quite as much as what we had. So we felt that what we were doing was okay. It just, it didn't sound continuous. Uh, uh, one of the big, uh, uh, you know, a few of, and we got a few flashes of uh, insight. One of them was when uh, Masaki Imai came to Australia and a number of us from Bosch went and at, as, uh, attended one of his uh, guest seminars. I'm and so this, happy. I'm so sorry. I'm so happy to hear my sensei's name, Sensei Masaki Mai. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this was uh, a first uh, eye opener. Uh, and this was really uh, where we suddenly realized that this continuous improvement means that the improvement comes uh, spontaneously and continuously bottom up. And you know, when you hear this, it, it challenges you, but you start to think, but, but look, maybe this is what can work in Japan. And this was a common feeling in the Western world. Look, it works in the Japanese culture, but it doesn't work in Australia, US, or U Europe. A second uh, wake up call came from uh, another well known gentleman, uh, Kiyoshi Suzaki. Mm -hmm. who wrote the book, The New Shop Floor Management. Yeah. And this book he released in uh, early 1994. Mm -hmm. And he actually visited us and spent three days at our plant in September 1994. And in this particular, uh, his focus was about uh, looking at the typical organization model of a shop floor and, you know, and, and his point was the way you run your organization and the way many organizations are run is that you have people at the top of a, uh, of a, of a pyramid, of a tree saying, I will tell you what to do. Huh. And all the people at the bottom are standing there looking up and saying, please tell us what to do. Oh. Yeah? And, and this is, and, and, and I said, this book, uh, uh, is one of the, uh, for those of you that don't know it, and you can see I keep a copy in hand, yeah, the new yeah. shop for management. And it even has a little dedication to Patrick from Kiyoshi Suzaki. Wow. Uh, and he basically, uh, uh, good luck in your pursuit of excellence. But what he does is he drew a little cartoon with a man who is sweating. Can you lift it up a little more? Oh. Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, so he's done a little cartoon of a man who is sweating. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and you see, this was really about uh, trying to say to us, you are uh, uh, looking at this with like a nice, you're feeling good about it, you're feeling nice about it, guys, you're only scratching the surface. Mm. But you see, these were two wake up calls and they were in our early days. And, you know, the impetus to uh, make massive changes wasn't there yet. But we kept running the way we did, yeah? There was another uh, refreshing of uh, uh, CIP process from the headquarters that gave a new impetus. But then came a period uh, where Bosch uh, realized that they really needed uh, a production system that was far more holistic and comprehensive. And the influence of this came from Toyota. <clears throat> Toyota had, had some uh, at high level, Toyota are always encouraging all their suppliers. But in this particular case, it was a very high level uh, suggestion approach to Bosch. Um, you know, we don't know the exact details, but what we know is 
that when Bosch decided to come out with a production system, they called it BPS, Bosch Production System. Mm. So the fact that it's very close to Toyota Production System is not a coincidence. Yeah, so what I hear you saying, Patrick, is that uh, the Bosch Production System, which you're going to uh, tell us further, did have, uh, has been influenced uh, by, uh, by Toyota, because Toyota people came and they taught you all, uh, but then uh, you all adopted the Toyota production system the way you all wanted, but they were behind the Bosch production system. Am I hearing you right? Correct. And I think Toyota, as Toyota always do, they always say to you, do not copy. First, understand the, 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 the whole thing holistically, what it is about, and then, and then move forward uh, into developing your system. And this is basically what Bosch did. Now, of course, the end, if you look at individual elements, uh, individual little points of the Bosch production system, they look and sound and feel extremely similar to TPS. Mm. It's not a coincidence. Um, so, so this was uh, you know, another uh, sort of strong influence. The other influence in, in this story, the other major uh, context change was uh, Bosch Australia moved from being a supplier to the local automotive industry to being a global supplier to the overall uh, uh, automotive industry. So that when you now fast forward to let's say 2003, 2004, 2005, uh, more than in some, in some of the uh, product areas, close to 95% of what was manufactured was exported. Mm. So basically we were supplying uh, the world and, they, and we were supplying all of the big names that uh, Bosch as an organization supplies. So a lot of European uh, customers. A lot of you are now would be thinking, well, you know, if you guys are supplying from Australia, which is at the other end of the universe uh, to Europe and in a world that was getting already in, in 2003, four, five, uh, already uh, just in time, how did that work? Well, for us, the, the answer is we had a really unique, very successful logistics concept. So uh, because we were making electronics, automotive electronics that was high value, relatively low, low small compact products, fairly light, we were using air freight. But the air freight we were using is we were packing into directly into aircraft containers that were, and we used uh, passenger flights. So basically oh. our product would go from the 4 p.m. flight uh, from uh, Melbourne to Singapore on Qantas. And in Singapore, the containers would be moved to the uh, Qantas flight that was usually in one of the next two dates, which was the Singapore Frankfurt flight. Okay. So it left Australia at 4 p.m it would get to Singapore, it would be transferred to the, the Singapore Frankfurt flight and it would land in Frankfurt 6 a.m. local time. And usually by anywhere between 11 a.m. and two or 3 p.m. local time, it was at the warehouse or at the customer. Wow. So what the, and we called this logistics concept uh, uh, follow the sun. So whilst we were at the other end of the world, we were ahead, you know, 10, 12 hours ahead, eight hours ahead, and we would use what we were ahead by to go uh, to, to, to meet the demands of our customers. So um, it was never uh, the same as being uh, next door uh, 
to a plant in uh, Wolfsburg or Ingolstadt or uh, Stuttgart or Munich, but it wasn't that far away from a lot of other suppliers in Europe that use road transport across Europe. So overall, um, uh, we did well. And I, uh, the only reason why I'm saying to that is that you understand the context that we were in. Yeah? Can I so, freeze you there? Sorry, sorry to freeze you there because I just want to uh, again. Uh, I'll tell you what I heard you saying that the concept of follow the sun. That's what you titled it as follow the sun. Because naturally you were on the east side of it, so we follow the sun. What I hear you saying is that you always met the customer's delivery date, right? Yeah. And it did not matter to you whether the transport cost was not all that important. What was important was the commitment that you gave to the customer on the delivery date, what the customer wanted from you. Have I correct. missed something on that? No, no, this is absolutely correct. So in other words, uh, whilst we were exporting, we were effectively running a uh, JIT, uh, typical of your industry, a JIT situation. Now, the reason for me for, to give you these uh, factors, and there was another factor to consider, and that is that uh, Bosch in traditionally had been a beautifully uh, structured and, and hierarchy uh, uh, set, up, set up organization, you know, from our German thing. So, in the uh, so from the shop floor, you had typically, uh, you know, several levels of supervision, right? and it was felt that this was very effective. And we believed it was very effective. But then we came to this realization. So all these, these, these things that I mentioned started to pile up together. And we started to realize that for us to be successful in uh, manufacturing, it was about making the most judicious, timely decisions at the closest point to where value is added or created. Or putting it another way, the further up the hierarchy you delegate uh, decisions, the more time you take, the more waste you create, and the quality of the decisions actually get worse rather than better. Yeah? And, and, and this, so all of this started to come together to us. So we started to say to ourselves, we've got to look at doing things differently. So we had in front of us the Bosch production system and suddenly the words of Suzaki-san, which was you run your shop floor with people at the top telling the next people down, this is what you should do. And the people next level down looking up saying, please tell us what to do. And it was a very efficient and very comfortable communication system. So we, we started to see all these things start to apply. And then we started to go back to even uh, Masaki Imai's thing about, you know, continuous improvement is continuous improvement. And it can only be continuous if it comes from the closest point to where value is added and created. If it's driven from somebody at the top telling people this, please come up with improvements, it was follow, continuing on with the same mindset of we'll tell you what to do and people below saying, please tell us what to do. <laughs> so we came to this sort of uh, 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 a whole set of things came together and we started to question, okay, how do we change this? And here's where, where the, and this is, I'm going to describe it in a few sure, minutes. Sure, sure, please. However, however, what you should know that when I describe in a few minutes, these were not decisions that were, or conclusions that were reached in the space of a one hour seminar or a two hour workshop. But 
they suddenly started to occur, uh, to, to uh, uh, arrive, we came to these conclusions because now we had a pull. The pull was, this is how the customer wants us to behave. The pull was, if we want to do this, we've got to make these decisions at the closest point. So then we started to ask ourselves some questions. And the first question we said is, why, what's stopping us from making the decisions at the closest point to where value is added and created? And the answers were, uh, you know, the first answer was, well, these people don't have the level of education, right? Partly true. Uh, then the next one was, you know, um, but then it's probably about improving the communication between these different hierarchy levels. Make it quicker? No. And then came this conclusion about ownership. You see, if you own a house, this is your asset, this is your property, and you will always look after it, and you will always find the money whenever you need it to maintain it, to improve it, to enhance it, because it's your asset. On the other hand, if you are renting a property, you're gonna do the absolute minimum to fulfill what the landlord's contract is. So look, some people may be a little bit more house proud than others, but basically they're the two levels of and so when we started to look at it, and I'm using this analogy because it was something that got us thinking, is saying, so, yeah. Yeah, mm. how do we, what's stopping us from getting the ownership at that level, closest point to where value is added and created? And the conclusion were basically, the very first conclusion was, well, we've created a hierarchy Ah. that guarantees that everybody is simply a tenant. So what you've got is a hierarchy yeah. that's a landlord and tenant. Yeah. You know, you just do this, I do this, you tell me, I tell you. And as long as we had that hierarchy, it was, it was never going to work. You can't, you know, if you've got three or four levels of passing on information, filtering it, modifying it, it doesn't add value. It certainly takes longer. And many of the real decisions that had to be made, if you analyze those decisions, they did not require a degree in engineering, mm -hmm. uh, even a certificate in engineering to be made, right? The quality of the decision was more about some more basic knowledge. And so we started to see now that what we had was uh, a little bit of a demographic in our shop floor, which were the haves and the have-nots. So the haves were the ones that had been lucky to do a trade school, had done uh, a, an engineering degree or some other qualification, and they were the haves. And the have-nots were those that never had a chance at education. They left school, they came to work, they did their best, and yet, what we said is what distinguishes those two people is not their fundamental talent, is not their fundamental uh, ability, but rather the education they have. Yeah. Um, and there came now one of those uh, uh, turning points. We had an HR department in Australia that were outstanding in their ability to really focus on forming people, on education, et cetera. And they said to us, look, you know, a lot of the local technical colleges run courses for industry. These people um, uh, are willing, have, have already got certificate courses ready to go, mm. and they would be able to give you, uh, to, to, to to provide this education, and a lot of it was at not an extremely high cost because the government was subsidizing it. So what we embarked in then for three to four years was a program of educating uh, our shop floor and 
we it was a combination of courses that were the courses were under the direction of the technical college so that at the end of a course everybody got a certificate that wasn't just you attended a Bosch course but it was actually a nationally accredited certificate. So this contained both the theoretical input and the practical uh, skills? Absolutely and in particular what we had was the content of a lot of the modules mm. was provided for by Bosch. So for example if it was a uh, a module on quality management and quality systems. Mm -hmm. Our quality management uh, team would provide the necessary input. Uh, I provided some inputs about uh, leadership principles. Others provided inputs about capacity planning. So that what we did is we, prov we, we would write our uh, uh, subject matter content to fit the model of the course yeah, so the course people would tell us you need to fit it into this format. And so we came up with this course and we rolled it out to uh, the people that we felt would be the most likely new generation of supervisors, plus another group which we said would be the up and coming supervisors. I hold you there so that I can paraphrase what I have understood especially mm -hmm. from what you have said in the last uh, two minutes or so, that you distinguish A, that uh, you told me uh, in, the, in the story, and I'm listening to you in the story, therefore I will not interrupt you, but just mm -hmm. to get the story back so that I, it plays on my head, A, you realize that the, you cannot treat it as an owner and a tenant, it has to be their own apartment so that they look after it well. Otherwise, mm. tenant has to always ask the owner where, if he has to do something or the other. Mm. The second thing that I heard you say is that the shop floor, you had two distinct uh, categories of people, one who were educated and the one that they were, they were not educated, but they were quite good enough, but they required education. So Bosch entered into an uh, agreement or understanding with certain universities or what have you. Uh, I could not get uh, which were the universities. However, colleges. They, were, they were, they in Australia, we call them TAFE, TAFE, which stands for Technical and Further Education. So they are technical schools, one level below the university. So, the, so uh, you took, you all, Bosch took the initiative of uh, getting them involved in it. However, what is what I like about what I heard you saying is, that the entire material what Bosch wanted was given by the uh, by the uh, executives, the managers. The entire syllabus per se was uh, was uh, what do I say? Tailor made for Bosch and handed over to the university to teach. Am I right to that extent? Correct. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. And the reason for this was that we said we have to. Uh, the, the context was a university, was a technical school uh, syllabus. So the technical school syllabus, these people have been doing, uh, you know, the making syllabus for education for years. So we're not going to try and tell them better. It was more about uh, the content, yeah. uh, was the Bosch specific content that was necessary uh, so that our people would, would come out as people that would know the same about our quality management system and a lot of our production system, the same as any other managers. What are the duration? So, pardon? What are the duration? Look, the, the, the typical course took between two to three years. Oh. Uh, so, so it was not an easy, it wasn't, it, it can't be uh, a short term thing. And we uh, certainly paid. The, it was in paid hours, so it was, I think, between three and four hours a week, plus okay. people had to do some, some homework and yeah. assignments, and there was a formal assessments process, the same as because people are awarded a certificate. Yeah. So, it's a, it was a, a, a comprehensive investment, and at the same time, we had made the decision that as the generation and, uh, of 
supervisors were reaching uh, retirement age, we would start to lean down the structure. So we went from a structure, a hierarchy of, of uh, four, five levels to a hierarchy that basically had two levels on the shop floor. How many levels you said? I mean, you did the restructuring. So from four or five, five six, six levels, you reduced it to two. Two levels. That is from two. top management to the shop floor. Uh, well, no, no, this was shop floor. So then, shop floor. Okay. The shop, so I'm not talking only about shop floor. You know, okay. we had five levels, and it was a. You see, you when when people looked at it from the outside, because they saw it was such a superbly efficient, well-structured uh, hierarchy uh, that it was, uh, it was great. But when we started to see the time that it would take and, and uh, the mindset, you know, people that were brought up in a system, which was about, I do what I'm told, I tell mm -hmm. others to do what they're told, and I report when I can't do it, it's very difficult to shift this paradigm. So basically, as they uh, uh, faded out of the organization, left the organization, we came back to this uh, uh, very lean uh, uh, hierarchy. But then we also had to change the way we ran the, the shop floor. So in, in the Bosch production, system and it's no different in the Toyota production system, we talk about manufacturing where value is added to be the top of a pyramid and everybody else is supporting this pyramid. As an inverted yes. pyramid. Yeah, it's an inverted pyramid. Yeah. Now, the problem with that um, uh, mindset or with that, that, that the objective is that initially a lot of people, myself included, saw it as meaning we had to, as senior managers, had to be seen on the shop floor, you know, occasionally and offer a few words of encouragement and look at a few boards and say, that's good, oh, that's not so good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the problem with that is that that is actually guaranteeing that the old mindset will continue yeah. because it's patronizing and it's effectively still saying, we know we're, 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 we're the smart ones. We're just coming down to, to show you that we care. Yeah? And look, it wasn't done with this sort of cynical mindset in mind. We only realize afterwards how cynical it would be. But initially, it was just done with the best intentions in the world. Yeah? And then what happened was that we started to change fundamentally the way we managed manufacturing. So you will note here a very interesting term. Before it was, how do we run the shop floor? to how do we manage manufacturing? Okay. And the, and the distinction I, I is- would, I would repeat what you said so, so that I get it, that uh, from the concept of how do we manage the shop floor, you went into a concept of how do we manage manufacturing? Uh, can you reword it for me again? No, no, this is correct. So, so in other words, there was a view of how do we manage the shop floor, yeah? And it was all about the shop floor is this area that we, is sort of messy and whatever. And when you talk about managing the shop floor, effectively, you're back to the original pyramid. The managers yeah. were down the shop floor, how do we manage it? Now we change the definition to how do we manage manufacturing? Mm. Manufacturing <laughs> is a process. Yes. Yeah? And the process has inputs and outputs. And interestingly enough, if you look at this process and you did a value stream and you did a value analysis of a manufacturing process, 
you would be struggling to find how managers and executives really added direct value. And you see, so, so uh, therefore we started to change it. So basically what happened in, in, in uh, the end result was this, yeah? So this is how manufacturing was run. Uh, there were no longer these big complex meetings that you would have monthly where you would discuss lots and lots of production schedule numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? This didn't mean that these processes didn't take place, but a lot of these processes were uh, scheduling would provide what they needed. Manufacturing would say, ah, that's no good, too many changeovers. We haven't got the people. We, uh, where's the material? You haven't got this and you haven't got that. What this process did is it didn't add any value. Because meanwhile, you had a customer that was sitting there and they couldn't care less about the good arguments and good uh, logic that we were showing between ourselves. It doesn't make a single difference to them. So what changed was that now the daily uh, schedules that were coming from our customers, what they needed uh, in terms of replenishment in their supermarkets, whether in a warehouse or at their own plant, would be coming and this would be fed back first thing in the morning, not to managers, uh, but directly to the team leaders running the value, the value stream on the shop floor. Okay. It comes to them. And these people now having had the understanding of what they were doing, understanding their line, the balancing, because you see all of these things like line balancing, standardized work, all of this was existing, but it was existing and made and only of the interest of engineers and managers. So we were just saying, oh, you're not following your standard work plan. You're not following your loading plan. But actually to make this, the real influence of that is right there, yeah? So these people now had this. And what they would do is they would start with a, a, with a, a, a drum beat every day of, uh, they would have their morning shift meeting where they would report on what they had the day before and uh, what the schedule they had just got, what they would be running for that day. And the, uh, the schedule came or the required came directly from the customer to the shop. Yeah, through, so the scheduling guy got his requirements, went to the shop. Now, you see, and what happened is to the manufacturing management and executive, we went to the shop. So the first part of our day was spent on the shop floor, not being, you know, pleasant and nice and shaking hands. How are you? A casual visit. But actually we were, we went in and our job was to listen in to the respective uh, uh, meetings. And wherever somebody, in a team leader would say, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that, I haven't got this, I need this. Our job was, okay, we're here, let's get this happening. So that's and, a paradigm shift that you're telling me that from a telling culture, you started going to the shop and started listening and removing whatever problems they had, you gave them the support by saying, fair enough, we will remove this obstacle from your way. Am I right in what is- Correct. It, but it actually went one level further. You see, ah. it, the, the level was that there was no other purpose for us to be there than to remove barriers. You, you see, in the good old days, it was, I need you, the shop floor, to tell me what you're doing, and I will make up my mind whether this is good or bad, <laughs> and I will patronize and we will make some comments. We're not doing anybody a favor here. This is our, remember, we're all here to manage the manufacturing process. We each have our individual leverage and, and, and opportunity. So what you had is, for, the, for example, when we had first introduced a new manufacturing line into a, one of the manufacturing cells, 
the guys who had introduced the line would attend these daily meetings for the first weeks to make sure that every day they are able to understand how it's running, what's happening, what they need to do, what they're planning to do, how they're planning to respond. And for many people, you know, it started, you know, you might think, well, you know, uh, uh, this is really hard work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The truth was it was made, life was far, far simpler. So there were far less PowerPoint slide decks prepared. There were far less emails and memos written. There were far less formal meetings called with everybody had to have an agenda and, and, and prepare notes and whatever. Uh, because the point is everything that had to happen had to happen there. So a team leader says, I, I, uh, you know, this particular module of my line is not working right. I need it right. Otherwise, I'm going to stop the customer. Um, that's it. There's, there's no, let's have a meeting about this and discuss it or whatever. This is it. Now, what also happened, of course, is now that they had the ownership and they had the support, now came all of the tool things or kits that we had downloaded, problem solving, uh, coming up with improvement ideas, etc. Everything was now coming up mm. because you see, mm. they own it. They own it because they have the skill, they understand it, they know what they have to do, and in effectively, uh, it's a pull system. Yes. The pull system is. We need the support. Here are our ideas. This is the means to the end. And you see what, what happens then is that the, the, the culture changed. Now, at the time when the culture changed, to be honest, we weren't aware so much of the massive paradigm shift. Because what we were actually doing is we were just immersed in, in, in it, yeah, you're immersed in it. But, uh, uh, you know, at some point where we had a few minutes to think, I remembered the, the famous, the little cartoon I saw of Suzaki-san, yeah. is that suddenly it was, everybody was sweating together on the floor where the value was added and created so that we got value added and created. Um, as opposed to everybody feeling extremely comfortable and walking around and shaking hands and saying, well done, good stuff, keep it up. Oh, that's no good. I don't like that. And then walking back to the office, calling a meeting of 25 people and debating uh, a problem that by the time we debated it was 10, 12, 24, 48, 72 hours old for which, you know, there was the old adage, the train had already left that station. Yeah, it's post-mortem. It's yeah. already dead. It's a, it's a dead, it's a dead issue. So this was um, um, the, the story. So- uh, Patrick, I'll just hold you there. This yep. paradigm shift from telling culture, from tenant culture to ownership, getting straight from the customer to the shop site and, the managers coming there to the shop site more with a concept by saying, how can I help? What's the problem? How can I help? Okay, it's not telling, it's just asking, how can I help <coughs> if I'm right? How long did this take? What's the gestation period for this? Uh, honestly, it was a, a good three, four year uh, gestation period. <coughs> There's just one little important point I would make. Yeah. Just one. Just one minute. I'll just just hold on. I'll just stop the recording for a second. Yep. Here we go. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. No, I, I think what I was going to say is. Um, yeah, it uh, took around three years, is what you said for this. Yeah, but yeah, then, no, about, just one minute, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's that. Uh, probably you do not even realize that three years have passed by because you all were so immersed and drenched with the concept that it just, the years must have just 
mood and you won't have realized that the entire paradigm has shifted. Absolutely. And, and you see, I have the advantage of, of uh, looking back uh, 25 years uh, of, of this organization and how everything had shifted. But these last years, the process was very quick. But I was going to, to mention a point to you of when you said, you know, the managers come to the shop floor and say, uh, where can I help? What can I do to help? To be very honest, this was not, this, what we looked at it was uh, even one level, the real level deeper. You ah. see, so what we said is the purpose of managers and executives in manufacturing is none other than make manufacturing occur. So we had a, 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 a you know, it was a sort of an in joke. There are 10 million good reasons every day why this is what we must do and we are paid to do. And the 10 million was our turnover was like, uh, you know, 200 and something million Australian dollars each working day, 225 working days. So it's 10 million. And so you see, if you were a production, a manufacturing manager, a manufacturing executive like me, yeah, and if you said, uh, you know, I've done some really good uh, work, strategic planning, uh, I, I issued some great reports, I uh, really uh, did a fantastic presentation to the board or to whatever about this, but we're not manufacturing. Uh, the bottom line is simple. I might as well not be there because all this other stuff is only necessary and only of value if the core of what we do is guaranteed. And you see, you can think about it in Bosch Australia, it's a fact of life that some of the products that we delivered, if we fail to deliver, we could stop 10, 15, 20% of, at one stage, the global car industry. So this is not um, a trivial thing. Yeah? This is not uh, a simple thing. But on the other hand, you see, you would the, the classical view of this is because it's so critical and because it's so important, we need to throw as many management and leadership levels in there to make sure it happens. The reality was quite the opposite. The less we had, right, the easier it was to see. Because you see, I, you know, my predecessors and even I could have participated in these meetings that, you know, everybody would get together at the end of the month and sometimes, you know, at the end of the week and present the outputs from your team. And this would be a big meeting that would last two, three hours and everybody would talk about it and everybody would say, oh, we're running behind on this. This is bad. We're going to have a problem. This is critical. It was a talk fest. Yeah. Uh, we called it uh, NATO. No action, talking only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, and, and you see, and, and what was the value? The value was supposedly that if a man at the top knew what had been produced, then somehow it could make things better or worse. It was no longer necessary. I didn't need to be told what we had produced for the month because I was there every day seeing what was down to every line. Yeah? And sometimes we couldn't get round to every line. Sometimes we, and we, we split ourselves. But the, the thing was that there wasn't like a, 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 a formal uh, process. Yeah? It wasn't about, you know, a uh, uh, regional president has now come to the line, everybody stops and shows great reverence. In fact, my, my, what my and the other managers did is, we were standing one or two rows back because the people that really had to hear were the people that were even closer to the value, to where value was added and created. So, you know, you had two or three rows of people standing up, but it was not in order of hierarchy, but in order of closeness to the no, yeah, value. Yeah. And, and, and you see, it's not, there's no, um, 
uh, big symbolism about this, honestly. It was about the guy who wants his thing fixed knows that if a machine is stopped, the guy he has to talk to is his maintenance partner. Talking to me, all that I can do, uh, and one of them told me that, he says, all that you can do is tell him what he should do. If I can talk to him directly, yep. it saves me two conversations, and I'll explain to him better what needs doing than you can. And it's true. And yep. So yep. our involvement was more about to say, look, we've got X, Y, Z uh, common problems. We've got to improve the management system, the management processes, the management uh, uh, culture. Um, and even then, you know, when you talk about management culture, it's amazing how if you sit in an office and sit in a workshop and you work out the culture you want, it looks great. You can make big A3, uh, po A1 posters of all the things you're going to do. You roll it out and six months later, uh, you've only done 3%. If everybody is together saying my job before anything else that I can do is to make sure we've achieved a 10 million, uh, we, we fix the 10 million uh, problem. Um, it's amazing how the culture uh, changes and nobody is looking anymore at playing hierarchy, uh, politics and whatever, because the job that's gotta be done is a job that's gotta be done. And we come back to this famous word, ownership yeah. ownership um and and i'll sort of finish this part of the story and then i'll throw over to you the questions about um and this is a real story that uh one of uh, uh fellows who was one of our team leaders he was a 35 year veteran of the company and when we were rolling this out even though he, had, he was of uh, uh, Eastern European background, so extremely well-educated already. So he took all of the stuff well, and he was always a person who was grumbling about what we wanted to do and whatever. And he, you know, I always used to say to him, look, you know, you own this. And he always said he didn't like that word ownership. Uh, he's just happy to do what he's told. Now, the thing is, it was interesting that in spite of all the grumbles, um, everything worked. Yeah? Now, what happened was that when we finished manufacturing in Australia, his whole cell was going to be transferred to Spain. And this cell had a whole lot of uh, equipment and lines that dated to, you know, that dated back 20, 25 years. Some of them were actually uh, pneumatic logic. And you know how many people can deal with pneumatic logic these days because they're all they know is PLCs. So our friends from Spain asked that he should accompany the line. So it was he said, oh, well, I'll go there for three months. He didn't like it much. And we thought, well, we're lucky if he's going to stay three months. After six months, he hadn't come back. He was, our colleagues from Spain were absolutely saying, what a great guy he was. And we said, oh yeah, look, he knows his equipment backwards. He said, no, no, he has got great shop floor management skills. He is an amazing shop floor guy. And we thought, oh, what happened? So I met him after he came back uh, from his assignment. And he, and the first question he told me, he says, you know what? What, what bothered me most about these guys in Spain, there was no ownership. Zero ownership. <laughs> I taught them how to own their manufacturing cell. And, and you see, I, I use that little example, and that is that sometimes when we assess the maturity of a system and we want to assess it as, as managers, we want to have everybody singing the song, yeah? And, and, and singing the lyrics, note perfect, so that it all looks good. And some people just don't, don't really like uh, singing that way. 
But the point is, they're still part of a choir and they're still effective. So what happens is really the change which we were looking for, we didn't bother too much with the cosmetics. Some of the, of, of the team leaders uh, didn't have their production boards, what you would call perfectly uh, complying to the standard. Some of them wanted their graphs to look different. And, you know, they were all hand-drawn graphs. Some of them wanted to report their numbers in a particular way. It's interesting that if you are the big manager, the profit comes down to the people, you want to see everything in one format so you can grasp it in one view. But what's the purpose of it? The purpose of it is not for me to grasp it, but for him or her to manage it and run it. And if having a different format makes it easier for them to manage it, and if I have to figure out six different formats across a production area, it's my problem to just suck it up, roll with it, and know that people are running it, as opposed to me imposing a burden that is non-value adding yeah, on people to say, please give it to me in this view. But you see, the continuous improvement then comes out because you see people, ideas come out and ideas are implemented. But the ideas that come out are far, far, far more uh, focused on what they want and need rather than what we would ask them to do and what they would give. So I'll give a, a little uh, example that uh, in one of the lines, they were pumping uh, uh, epoxy resin. And so, you know, everybody knows that with uh, pumping in epoxy, the whole maintenance of the pumps yep. and the, the continuous strip down and reconfigure yep. is absolutely crucial. And one of the things that happened is one day they found a problem that somebody had reassembled the pump, but there was one little ball bearing that was missing and the whole pump wore off far quicker. And traditionally, if this was a uh, something that had happened, they would be in the, in, in the management uh, meeting room, a big uh, 25 megabytes of PowerPoint slides with experts telling you how to do this, how to do that, how to do everything, yeah? They came up and just said, oh, our countermeasure <clears throat> and our improvement is the following. And what they showed us was uh, a big piece of uh, stainless steel in which they had drilled holes for the specific ball bearings, and they had big, they had marked out like a shadow board all the different components of the uh, of, uh, pump. So rather than the old fashioned way of dismantling a pump and putting it all in little boxes on the shop floor, on the workbench, this was basically a, a shadow board, but structured. And what they did, is they basically took every single component, put it into the respective area, and then when they reassembled it, at every stage of the reassembly, they would look at, at this point, what's missing. And if you look at that system, it was dead simple. They made it themselves, yeah? So I mean, actually uh, just making the kit ready, the entire yeah. kit ready. And Correct. if there is anything that is left behind, it's that you have not put it back, put it into the... Correct, correct. Right. And, and you see, this is the, 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 the difference is that, you see, you can preach uh, yeah. standard work and you, can, and, and you can have lots and lots of nice standards. And you see the standard work for this operation had 
pages with a big photo of what it should be and an, a, a five word instruction. The problem is it was like 45 pages. And what happened is, is it didn't tell you the critical part, which was, you know, if somebody had pulled the parts, all the ball bearings into a little cup, all the things on a rag, uh, all the, the seals uh, hung, up, hung up on a hook. It was like, like a workbench, like a maintenance workbench. When you put it back together uh, and you're putting it back together, there is no direct visual feedback of it. In fact, they only found out afterwards that the ball bearing was missing when somebody went back to the workbench and said, oh, there it is in the bottom of a cup. And the problem and, and the ability to see it when you've got a cup with a little, nice little residue of grease in the bottom, zero, no chance. Uh, change, change it to a, a system like that and it works. And, they, and this was, you know, this is just giving you some, some uh, uh, examples, but- Oh, that's it, so relevant, so relevant, it's true. Co correct, correct. But you see, because it changes the process. Yeah, where I'm coming from is, it is not a poster management. It, it, you know, it's so much talked about visual management, but here is something which is practical, which tells you that this is not correct or this is not yet finished. It tells you, it is not just, is it, that's where uh, I like what you said is, uh, Visual management is all about control. No, there's not about control. It just tells you that, look, something more has to be done. There's a piece left over here. So there you are. It's yeah, and you see, the, the, if you look at that example as well, and, it's, and, and, I, and I use it to, to, to point something out. You see, the ownership of the yeah. error. Yeah. See, they own the error. So it wasn't like it's our fault. An error is an error. Everybody. Yeah. You know, the Bosch view was all human is error. Yeah, yeah. We're all going to make mistakes. Nobody is perfect. But in the past, it was uh, you know it, the patronizing approach was we would use a generic term operator and uh, error or machine setter error or maintenance fitter error, which are nice generic statement which are fine to neutralize, but it's basically uh, a case of a mistake, an error, a fault, floating somewhere in a politically correct world. And the problem with that is, yes, there is a problem-solving process, but what comes out the other way around is people say, I own that error. And there is no need for management to say, what are you going to do about it? Because the answer is clear. It can't happen again. It can't happen again because they own the process. They, nobody has to tell them how critical manufacturing is. You, you know, you don't need managements to preach to you. You know, the customer, we're very close to the customer. You don't need to preach to them. They know. They know this is what I need for this particular product. This is what happens if this goes wrong. And they're the closest to the value is added and created. And they will they have been given the education and the training. So we have empowered them. You see, it's in the end, the word is empowerment. But empowerment in our context is never a nice feeling of managers telling everybody, you're empowered. We want you to be empowered. Empowerment is not a feeling word. Empowerment is a doing word. And leadership only empowers people if it sets them up to succeed. What we were doing before is we were setting people up, maybe not knowingly, to fail. Because we basically just picked some smart people, but all these smart people could do is tell others what to do. We would tell those people what we wanted them to do. Uh, but in the end, where the value was added and created, what matters to the customer was where the weakest link was. So failure was almost, you could argue, inevitable. And we were not consciously, but subconsciously, the system was setting people up to fail. 
And leadership has to take responsibility for that, just like leadership has to take responsibility to set people up to, to succeed. So I've done a lot of uh, talking and I've told the no, story. Uh, that's, so that's I'd love you now to do no, uh, a that's challenge. Perfect. That's perfectly fine. Questions. And uh, I apologize because, you know, I'm not recording you in a studio. This is my study room and my house and I'm here with my dog. So there's a lot of barking that is going on. So I apologize for that. And uh, I'm sure because I like this uh, narration, I liked and I don't want to ask any questions because I don't want to add jargon and say, did you do Jidoka? Did you do this? Did you do that? No, I'm not talking about that. I like the way uh, the flow has been. And uh, I would suggest that, you know, uh, I like uh, the entire concept that emerged and uh, is something very revealing. And, and I like the title which we said that we are going to do a Bosch story right and it's a story and you are the story is narrated so i am not questioning the story because it's true and you have been able to sustain it that's the most important part of it so i just ask you one liner what is the the secret of sustaining the boss story that's the only question I ask you. And I oh, think that's just a, one liner. Let's see how that. Um, look, I would describe it uh, this way. And, and it goes back to um, uh, what Suzaki san had been talk, talking to us about. Yeah. And if this was about, it's about you know, human, uh, when Robert Bosch spoke about human dignity, yeah, and human uh, capability. And we talk in the Toyota production system, respect for people. What we really looked at was the respect of the human capability. Uh, so if you say it's the respect for the human capability is the good part and the confronting part, uh, the confronting part is that at any time in our organization, people were walking in the gate and leaving 75% of their intellectual faculties at the gate. And in some cases, 80 or 90% of their soul at the gate. And this was because we had created a system that said, we, the smart enlightened ones that are paid a lot of dollars, will tell you what to do. And all the other people said, well, the best way to earn a dollar here is to switch off your soul and most of your brain and just wait for the orders to come and if we do that, everything is good. We go back home, we earn our money. And, um, the, and, and the problem with this system is that it is actually extremely comfortable for everybody. So the managers, uh, whenever they have a problem, all they have to do is tell somebody else to tell somebody else that they've got a problem. And then we fix the problem, you know, so you fix the problem by saying, let's run an extra 20% inventory buffer, uh, let's throw in 25 more supervisors, 30 more engineers, let's go and fight with the board to get uh, an extra three lines. It was all like that, it was all very comfortable, you see, but none of us at the leadership were sweating, mainly because we were sitting in air conditioned offices but also because it was just a nice, comfortable process. Um, but in between, we believe that we were respecting people because we were coming down to the shop floor, shaking hands and smiling. But the true 
reality was that if you really respected human dignity, you would know that every one of these people is dealing every day in their private lives with things 25, 50, 100 mm -hmm. times more mm -hmm. complex yes. than what they're doing at, yes. at work. Yes. And, and, and yet, the reason why we can't harness this potential is because we've made everything comfortable for ourselves. And we make it even more comfortable by doing something called CI, continuous improvement, and coming up with a lot of things where we keep saying to people, please make suggestions. Here's a, a, he is a, he is a cinema ticket. Here is a badge. Here is a cap. Here is $200 for making a suggestion. Aren't you great? Here is your photo in the company magazine with a big boss shaking hands. What we're doing in these routines is continuing the nonsense. We're not really respecting human dignity. We're placating them. We're patronizing them. And in the end, it makes it even more so that, you know, they say, well, it just means that I can switch on an extra 5% of my soul and an extra 10% of my intellect from time to time just to get a bit of attention. And the rest of the time I switch it off. Right? And, and I said, you know, that this was it for 15, 10, 15 years before that was what it was. What it was in the end was quite different. Every day was never something you could plan because you can't plan what the customer is gonna want. Yeah? We said, how can you plan customer demand when you as a customer buying a car, you're not quite sure which color you want until you walked into the showroom. You're not sure which options you want until you walked into the showroom. So if, if we expect that, and we want our customers to be successful, we have to do everything to make them successful. And that means we is a group of people rather than one, a few brains and a whole lot of pairs of hands. Thank you very much, Patrick, because I am not getting into any terminologies which we normally use, mm. but this is, uh, to me, it has been a revelation. I thought this only existed as a dream, but then hearing the Bosch story, I understand that this is achievable and you all have achieved it. You all have sustained it. That's what I hear you saying. Mm. Um, right, sir? Correct. And, and look, Dr. Ram, I think the big thing is that if you say you use a term a dream we never saw it as a dream in fact there were many days that we thought this is a nightmare <laughs> but, but you know that's but but you see that but that's the reality you see that we were instead we were facing <clears throat> reality rather than sitting in a dreamland so if I could pass any lesson to anybody watching this is, you know, if you look at our story, it took us in hindsight far too long <clears throat> to get to the conclusion. Right? So that's the first moral of the story. The second moral of the story is the more you think you've got a good CI suggestion system, that you feel that your effort has to be to patronize, encourage, and support, the longer you will delay facing the reality. That was us. We were very happy and comfortable with this nice little series. And the final conclusion is the words I used just a few minutes ago is, if you think that every day in your plant, most of your employees, not just those on the shop floor, but most of your employees, maybe leaving 60, 70, 80% of their brains. And the other number is 80 to 90% of their souls. And here I use the term soul is that the genuine, what drives this ownership, this willingness to support each other. If, if they're doing that, then your, what, what you have to do <clears throat> is look for that because that's the biggest waste. Yeah. And 
once you've un unleashed that, then everything else, whether it's Jidoka, all of the other uh, tools you can have, poker, your case, standardized, where all these things become, and then CI becomes. But if you don't harness them, you will be working uh, a lot on sustaining continued improvement. And if you think about that term carefully, it's actually, you could say it's an oxymoron. Because if it's continuous, what do you need to sustain? I like it. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yep. yeah. So with that, thank you very much and uh, mute you again. Thank okay. you. Take care. That was a lovely, lovely session. Thank you very much.